is kind of like Saul in that respect. That's what I was kind of wondering about. But the, but the question I was thinking about with this text for today is, what do you do when you've done the same thing over and over and over again and it doesn't seem to be working? What do you do? How do you get out of that situation? How are you able to move on? That's not always easy. Do you just keep on doing what you're doing? Well, then that kind of makes you think about that whole story about the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I think that many psychiatrists and psychologists would bristle with that definition, but it works for my purposes, so I'll just go ahead and use it. But it can be very hard to change, to get out of your rut, to do something different. Now, in the text today, we are kind of reminded a little bit about what has come before us, after all. The tribal confederation in the book of Judges had broken down. It wasn't working well. The people didn't like being reliant upon those charismatic leaders that would rise up from time to time to judge them and to govern them. And so they wanted to be like all the other nations of the world. And they asked to have a king. They came to Samuel and said, we want a king. And Samuel went to God, and God says, well, it's, it's me that they're rejecting, not you, Samuel. And Samuel gives them all the reasons why they shouldn't want a king, but they insist, give, me a, give us a king. So God chooses Saul for them. I always like to remind people that when they say that God has chosen this such and such a leader, to remind them that God also chose Saul. Sometimes God chooses leaders who probably aren't good leaders, but they're kind of to teach us a lesson. I think that's probably what was going on with Saul, because here you have this guy that is appointed by God, and yet he ends up being a complete disaster. The people are at a loss. He has fallen away. He has rejected God's guidance again and again and again, and now the people are trapped. We've got this guy as our king. What do we do? How do we get out of this situation? Well, fortunately for the people, God understands the nature of the problem. And God agrees to do something about it. So he calls upon the prophet Samuel to do really one last major action in his life. And that is to anoint a new king. Now Samuel, like many religious leaders, understands that there are hazards with certain actions. He's afraid. He's afraid that Saul, if he finds out he has anointed another king, Saul will kill him. We know from the stories in the Bible that Saul was certainly not above killing rivals. That was not something he was concerned that kept him up at night. So it seems very plausible, Samuel's fear. But then we learn that it's important sometimes for God's messengers to be crafty. God actually gives Samuel a cover story. <laughs> well, just, just go to Bethlehem and say that you are performing a sacrifice, and just make sure Jesse, the father of whom I'm going to have you anoint, is present there with his sons. Okay, so that works. He gets Jesse there, and Jesse is there with all of his sons. Apparently not, though, but we don't find that out until halfway through the story. you got to love the storyteller really knows how to craft it, doesn't he? Or she. Because David is never mentioned until the very end. And in fact, the way the story is told, it sounds like all of the sons were there. And none of them were acceptable to God. Oh, but, 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 but wait, 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 wait. Okay, I guess there's one more, kind of Columbo style, I guess. Wait, 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 there's one more, there's one more. And then David enters the picture. With the oldest son, I think, like I said earlier, I think he probably was reminiscent of Saul. He was tall and handsome and strong, and Samuel was like, this is the man that should be king. But God says to him, no, 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 no. We already tried that. How did that work out? Oh, oh, right, right, right. It's funny that Samuel is this prophet who you would think has been so close to God for so long ever since he was a little boy, still didn't get that important piece about how God works. 
But I guess it just goes to show you that we can all miss the boat from time to time. God says that God looks at the heart, not at the outsides. So we realize that God values things that people don't always value. And so, just as it looks like in the story that we've run out of sons, and in fact, we kind of have run out of sons because there's nobody else left there, Jesse, the father, says, well, I mean, I have that other son out there, just out there, you know, keeping the sheep, I guess. Is that what we're talking about here? And so, he is sent for. And behold, he is the one with the pretty eyes and the ready complexion who ends up getting chosen as king. I can't imagine what that must have been like at that moment. Jesse and the elders of Bethlehem were already worried when Samuel showed up. They were like, did you come in peace? And Samuel told them, yes. Now, in hindsight, they probably are thinking, Samuel, you lied to us. You told us you were coming in peace, but you have just appointed this shepherd kid as king. And you have to know that Saul is not going to be happy about this. So was this really so peaceful? Or did they just kind of hush it up and say, well, let's just keep this between ourselves, okay? Because this is a scary time. Change is not easy, and changing leaders is never easy either. Saul's leadership has been a disaster. Will things be any different with David? Now, of course, we know how the story ends up, right? David does end up becoming king, and he becomes probably, in many ways, the best king in the entire story of Israel. Still not by modern standards very good, I might add. He made some pretty serious mistakes that were pretty awful. No, he wasn't a good dad. He wasn't a lot of good things. He wasn't a good husband either. Look at his relationship with his wives and his daughters. Oh my gosh. But, but nevertheless, the part that is important to remember is what God says to Samuel. What is it that matters to God with people? It's the heart. And that is the trick when it comes to David. David was not always a good person. He was a man of violence, whose, whose all his rivals to the throne mysteriously end up dead. Now, the Bible always is careful to write it so that he is not personally responsible for it, no, no, nevertheless. But it still conveniently worked out that way. And his sons all have these terribly messed up relationships that end up with them killing each other. And he steals another man's wife, and when it turns out he could get exposed, he kills the guy off to hide it. So this is a man that, if you were to look at him based on his actions, you would say, well, he did do some good things, but overall, his bad things kind of overwhelmed the good things that he did. So what are we lifting up here? Well, there's a couple things, of course. One is to remember that the writers of the, this part of the, the Old Testament didn't think that kings were a good idea. And so basically, this is the story of the downward phase of the whole country because they chose to get a king. And so you kind of see, well, David, here he is, this great guy, and yet even he's a lousy king. So there's kind of a message there at work, that kingship itself is the problem. And so that's part of the issue. But the thing I think for us today to remember, because we're not going to be appointing kings anytime soon, is that it's a matter of the heart. David's heart was with God. Now, we can't always control our actions. Sometimes we're going to do things that even we don't want to do because we just can't seem to control ourselves. Our actions may not always speak well of us. They may not always properly represent God in this world. Oftentimes, we will fail. We will fall down over and over again. And maybe at the end of our lives, people will look at us a lot like they did with David and say, well, he did some good things, but overall, he... But that's where the heart comes in. God looks at the heart. David could do all of those things, good and bad, 
but his heart was always with God. And I think that for us, today, that's the important message. Good or evil, wise or foolish, because we're going to do all those things. But nevertheless, is our heart with God? It's a good thing they have rubber bones, isn't it? Well, there was a bit of a delay there, but it took us a little bit of time. She got there. So the important thing for us today is to remember the matters of the heart, to keep our heart with God. And when it comes to change, we need to also keep that in mind. How can we follow a path of the heart? Some theologians describe to God as the heart of the universe, a model that I really love, this idea that God is the heart that loves and loves and loves and also holds everything together. So how can we have our hearts be in line with God's heart? We need to always be willing to make changes in the middle of our courses. Because sometimes what we're doing again and again is not working. So we need to look for the way of the heart and follow it. Sometimes it'll be hard. Other times it will be easy. But in the end, we can end our mission here on earth knowing that we stayed with our hearts in God.